Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we honor you, Lord God. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for your word, for your son, God. This week we are remembering your sacrifice. Daily we remember your sacrifice, but this is a week that we are celebrating uh, the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord God. We are remembering, Lord God, what you did for us, and it's indescribable. It's it's no way that we can fathom what you went through. An innocent, uh, innocent man, hallelujah, glory to God, still being God, but innocent, loving us and caring so much for us that you would, hallelujah, to come and, and give up yourself and spill out yourself as an offering, as a, as, a, as a blood offering, as a sacrifice for our sins so that we would have access to the Father and access to eternal life. We do not take that for granted. We do not take it for granted, dear Heavenly Father Jesus, your sacrifice, and we love you and we honor you for it. I thank you, God, for just giving us this word on tonight, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would touch the hearts and the minds of your people, that they would be receptive, Lord God. Open up the eyes of their understanding, Lord God. Open up their hearts, those who have trouble even comprehending your word, even, even when it's preached. Those who feel kind of lost, even when it seems simplistic. I hear you, Lord. I thank you right now for opening up their ears, Lord God. Not their physical ears, their hearing, they can hear fine, but... They have been having, some have been having trouble with understanding how this all connects. So I pray, Lord God, as I speak this word by God, by your power, by your anointing, Lord God, that they would have understanding, that they would have an understanding and, and even more appreciation for the blood, that they would silence those voices that are telling them that they do not belong or that they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven or that they could not be a son. Those who are confused about their identity, not just um, a, about a gender, Lord God, but those who are confused as to if they are yours. I pray, God, that this message would be, bring clarity in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray, God, that through this word, the enemy would be exposed, that he would flee, that you would give your people power. God, even in this time, that you would give them clarity, Lord God, and understanding and even added revelation as I speak. Open up their eyes, open up their hearts in the name of Jesus. God, we pray. We pray. I pray that your spirit, your presence, your presence will go into the homes, go into their minds, comfort them, bring peace in the mighty name of Jesus. As this word is going out, Lord God, give them new strength. Give them a fresh wind and understanding. God, we thank you. We love you. And regardless of what's going on around us, even though we are ignoring, we're not ignoring it. We are present. We are here because we're in the earth for this time. We do not miss your, dismiss your sacrifice. We honor that on tonight. We honor it daily. Daily, we commune, not just when we break the bread and drink of the communion wine or the juice, Lord God, but daily, we remember your sacrifice because daily we are dying. Daily, we are sacrificing God, hallelujah, daily so that you would be pleased so that you will be honored with the sacrifice of our life and our worship. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So praise the Lord to everybody that came in, in the midst of the prayer. Um, as I said before, if you just um, have come in, um, this is going to be a series. So this is going to be the first um, teaching or message of the series and some of you you probably didn't see the Facebook post that I posted some time ago I posted um, that the Lord actually had given me a dream and this is where this message um, first came from but the way he took me was totally you know in a different direction of what the dream the dream was but in the dream um I kept seeing all these different VIN numbers and I'll get into what a VIN, VIN number is very shortly, but I saw all these VIN numbers just floating around and I just heard this voice saying, you know, that some of my children aren't checking or discerning in order to know the source and the authenticity of some of these voices that are speaking. So it's not just, you know, not just 
you know, prophecies. It's not just, you know, um, different people, you know, and all these different things that are being say, said. It's, it's period. I, we're not even talking about, you know, our human audible voice. We're talking about the voices that sometimes, you know, can be in, in some, some's head, you know, period. I'm talking about natural and spiritual voices. The Holy Spirit was saying that they aren't checking or, or, or able to discern to know the source. We are always supposed to check the source of, um, uh, of the, um, uh, uh of the voice. We're supposed to, you know, some people can eat anywhere you know and some people are very careful of what they eat what they partake of you know so the lord was stressing that importance to me even in my sleep i just kept hearing it so i quickly woke up and i wrote down what the lord said and he said this is a message you're going to bring a message and i want you to bring the people um bring before the people um the bearing the marks of christ what it what does it look like um, when you bear the marks of Christ. So we'll be breaking down different messages and in different subjects as it falls under the line of identity as it relates to bearing the marks um, of Christ. And so this first episode um, or teaching is in reference to um, it is still bearing the marks of Christ, but we're going to deal with the foundational stuff, you know, um, and all that good stuff. So I'm kind of flowing differently. Usually when I come on, you all see me just talking right now. I have my notes. Sometimes, as you all know, y'all see how I flow on Facebook and I type. I hear the Lord and as I'm typing, that's how he flows. And this is how he brought this teaching to me. So when I'm looking down, I'm writing everything that the Lord was releasing to me within the time, you know, studying and everything like that. If you want to get... Um, a piece of paper so that you can write down these scriptures. Um, if you so desire, I believe that it would be beneficial to you to go back so you can look at, you know, and all of that, not just because um, you're hearing me, but um, I'm hiding behind Jesus. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, so even when you go out to answer some of the questions that some people may have in the world or even other believers, you can refer back to those same scriptures, you know, and you can say, oh, I remember, you know, when your pastors are teaching or, you know, whenever you see these things, it's good to write them down, to um, meditate on them, to study them, you know, so you can be able to give an answer. Okay, so I told you all about that that, that dream or, or, you know, what I just kept hearing in that vision of the, the VIN numbers floating around. So once I woke up and I wrote them down, I hope you all can see me good because the kids broke one of the stands. Can I give me a thumbs up or something if you can see me good because it's looking crazy on here. But as long as you can, you know, hear my voice. Okay, so I woke up and I know what a VIN number is, but I went to check. Um, because I wanted to write down the actual thank you so much for giving me the, the thumbs up to let me know that you all can um, see and everything is good. And so um, I went to look up what a VIN number is and it says VIN, V-I-N, is a short is short for vehicle identification number, which some of you probably already knew. It's usually found on cars and it is a 17 digit code compromised of capital letters and numbers that uniquely identifies a vehicle. Each letter and number provides specific pieces of information about your vehicle, including the year, the make, the model, the engine size, and the manufacturer. Somebody say, and the manufacturer. Praise the Lord, Charmika. Okay, so now we're not cars, of course. Um, cars are not living things, but everything that is created or manufactured has something to identify it in order to trace it back to its source. OK, books, those of you who are authors out here, let me see your authors. OK, books have ISBN numbers, which stand for International Standard Book Number. And the purpose is to establish and identify the title or edition of the title from one specific publisher um, to the to the next or the one title from the next. And it allows for a more efficient marketing of products by booksellers, libraries, 
and other distributors. So if you're wondering why is this little book, you know, why is this little barcode on the back of my book? That's why. Okay. So a lot of people are also familiar with the EAN and the UPC code, which is standard and retail. If anyone works in retail and Macy's, you know, or something like that, you might be familiar with that. Or if you are your own boutique owner, you know, so the UPC barcode is widely used in the US, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries, and other countries countries for tracking trade items in stores okay here we go with tracing back all right so you will see barcodes on individual items because each barcode is unique to the product that it represents so if you worked in the store like i said you may have also seen a SKU number yeah we're gonna break down we're gonna break it down a SKU number SKU if you ever worked at Walmart you know I worked there for three days but um, it is a stocking number that identifies the model, color, or the size of something, okay? All items that are exactly the same have a store number or a SKU number to identify that number. Now, these are things that you buy, but living things or creatures have or wear things that identify them as well, right? So once you purchase a dog, if you purchase a dog, um, immediately some who are smart and don't want, you know, that thousand or three dollars three thousand or five hundred or that gifted dog of yours you know to be lost and you cannot trace it back to you so what do you do you immediately you know purchase a collar i don't know if there's any paperwork in, in involved i haven't got a dog yet but i know that i'm going to get me you know a collar so the purpose of a dog collar is to restrain <laughs> Uh, identify the owner for fashion or as well as for protection and where to return the dog if it is lost, okay? People make themselves brands or create brands. Your brand is the promise to your customer. It tells what the customer can expect from your products, your service, and it sets you apart. It is derived from who you are, what you want to be, and who people perceive you to be. A brand consists of a logo, a message, your, your life testifies to your brain, everything you do from your emails to what you wear, how you answer the phone, how you send your uh, signature at the end of your email, email, everything speaks of your brand. So you don't get out here and say, oh you know I can live and I can act and I can do whatever and I can get you know drunk and act silly you know no because you are your brand your brand is not something printed on a piece of paper your brand is not something that's plastered on your social media you are the face of your brand you embody your brand so there are so you are the I you you identify with your brand so there are people who have to wear special identifiers. My mother-in-law, she wears a silver bracelet on her arm called a diabetic ID bracelet. They made some to appear very fashionable, but it has information that can be life-saving for medical responders in the event that she ever needed treatment. I remember when I was younger, my grandmother had one of those and I thought it was cute. And when I was young, I used to take, you know, pictures out of the magazine and I would, you know, cut out the earrings and actually take them to my ears and take the bracelets to my arm, the watches to my arm and take the necklaces to my neck or whatever like that. And so I really loved jewelry. So my grandmother had one and I said, can I hold it? And so she said, yeah, cause you know, we're in the house. So I put it on and I'm all in the house thinking I'm cute with this big silver bracelet that's hanging all down here on my fingertips. And my mother saw it and she said, take it off. And I said, why do I have to take it off? And she said, it's dangerous to label or identify yourself as something that you're not because if you pass out somewhere and if you ever need to get treatment, if you ever are, are somewhere where you aren't around me and you have this bracelet on, you're going to be treated as a diabetic. So I'm like, okay, so that's the same even today, even if you were it, hallelujah, even if you did it and participated in it, it's not who you are. Be careful who and what you identify yourself with or as, hallelujah. Somebody say, take it off, take it off, take it off. He taught on my so-called Hey, take it off, take it off. Hallelujah. Here are some identifiers or labels that are not good and have been used to identify people. Through the harsh and inhumane punishment of slavery, men and women were branded. I'm not talking about just a little, you know, tattoo or something like that. I'm talking three third degree burns to mark those who tried to escape 
into freedom. Owners of men and women were made slaves uh, who were made slaves would be branded on their palms, on their shoulders, on their um, buttocks, on their cheeks um, with a branding iron so they would be able to identify these men and women as slaves as well as property. I once read not too long ago um, about a trial for human trafficking that was only in 2017 and the woman being interviewed spoke on how the women were branded with categorizing pens and a categorizing pen is actually a pen that doctors use in surgery um, internally, not even outside of the body, but inside of the body to actually stop the bleeding. Hallelujah. So some of these women were, were being branded by categorizing pins as an instrument um, 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 to, uh, by this instrument to be um, joined into these cults of, of human trafficking. Some of the women's pers women persuaded um, were um, Hallelujah. They had the initials of their leaders burnt onto their skin, and they were also told to sign over different paperwork, um, including bank accounts and um, vehicles, all kinds of things. They said that they used this brand as a way to memorialize their body memorialize on their body the promise that they made to the cult. They also refer to themselves as slaves. And their motto was, you surrender your life, mind and body for unconditional use. And that the best slave and that the best slaves derives the highest pleasure from being her master's ultimate tool. And this was from the New York uh, Times.com. But so many are looking for acceptance, to be accepted to be comforted, to have a place to belong. And most people gravitate to cliques or groups for many different reasons. Many people find themselves in these situations, not all because, you know, they did something wrong, but sometimes that just longing to belong, that 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 longing or, or that void that they have in their life, they're seeking, you know, to, to fulfill it. Hallelujah. And so sometimes some, some, not all, wind up going into things, hallelujah, that are, are, are hard harmful to them. And so sometimes it's based on, um, this reason is it's based on looks, on the color of their skin, their interests, their social status, how much money they make, how good or even how bad a person seems to be. Many seek to find commonality anywhere and as a result, some even join gangs, which leads to branding. Some require their close friends to brand themselves by sharing a tattoo and some in fraternities brand themselves to show their dedication to their organization. These brand systems or identifiers not only reveal what is what, what one is a part of in the world system but they are also found in the demonic system and some of these systems are being and will be played out on earth through the leading of Satan and those in his kingdom okay revelation 13 16 and 17 says and he causes all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or when or in their foot foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the Bible foretells of a time that there will come where people from different walks of life, great and small, poor and rich, will have commonality and having a desire to take on the mark, which is the name or the number of the beast name. How do we know what that commonality would be? You know, what do we have to look out for Jesus? Okay, well, we can look in the scripture and see what some of it, some of it will be. Revelation 13, 13 says the second beast performed great signs, even making fire come down of heaven in the presence of the people. So they'll be deceived by false miracles, okay? Even though it's been written. Look at how many today are eager for a sign. Look at how many have a belief of not believing in anything, mostly important, importantly, God, because they cannot see him. How many have turned away from Jesus Christ because they cannot see him in their situation? I understand we were brought up on fairy tales and all kinds of stories, but later came to find that when we were older, Santa wasn't real, the tooth fairy wasn't real, the leprechaun wasn't really gonna pinch you if you didn't wear green. We understand that they were all fables, but what is written about the man from Nazareth, Galilee, 
Galilee were true accounts. He, he was seen by men and women. Many witnessed his birth, death, and his resurrection. They witnessed his power. And like many today, he is remembered throughout history. Accounts of his life was written, but still many don't believe. And this unbelief in who is not seen, but the belief in what is seen will be the very thing to cause many to be deceived. In Matthew 16, verse 1, the Bible speaks of a time when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he showed them a, a, a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. The scriptures go on to say that Jesus answered them saying, what is it when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning today, a storm for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Jesus was referring to himself. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees continue to ask him for signs and for miracles. And the Bible says in Matthew 12 and 40, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, a man, and now one greater than Jonah is here. So even when Jesus was before them in the flesh, still this generation asked for a sign, something else to identify who the savior was. Jesus told his disciples the parable of the rich man who died and lifted up his eyes in hell, being in torment. And the Bible says he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He said he had five brothers and he asked if he could be sent back to his father's house to warn them and to testify so they would not come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, but if one comes from the dead and they will repent. Look, if somebody comes with this miraculous sign, someone will repent. If they come with something crazy and something that they have never seen before, maybe they're going to repent. And he said to them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through the one rose risen from the dead. Who was he referring to in this parable? Jesus, he would rise from the dead. He performed many miracles. He cast out devils. He performed healings, which they had never seen. And still they wanted a sign. How many today are seeking for a sign? How many times does God have to confirm your ministry? How many times does God have to tell you that he will never leave you or forsake you? How many times has some gone out to the psychics and other sources for a sign? How many today have such a great desire to know about the supernatural? And I don't mean the supernatural power of God. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. You say light this, wave that, go here, put a shell there, lay a crystal here, and people do it. They buy into it because they are searching within their hearts for solutions but don't want the commitment from God and figure oh these idols and these spells and these rocks and these stones they want nothing from me they don't want the commitment from me that this God wants he has too many conditions I don't want a relationship I just want the help I just want the little magic show. I just want the pain to leave. I just want to relax. I just want to get the man. I just want the money. I just want the house. I just want the core, uh, the cure. I don't want to surrender. Some even want the spirits out, but how do you put out spirits by conjuring in more spirits? How do you cast out the devil if you're calling on the devil or one in his kingdom? John saw in a vision the beast rise out of the sea. And he said, upon his seven heads was the name blasphemy, which is the act of insulting. As I'm telling this, think about what's taking place in the world, what they are doing, the things that they are saying or portraying about our Savior. Okay? Insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God, God's people or the sacred things of God, burning, destroying, vandalizing places where believers gather, persecuting the saints of God and desecrating that which is of God, unfair treatment of God's people and business because of who and what they believe and what God stands for. The Bible tells us the second beast is called the false prophet. 
and he will require the people's worship of the beast. Now, how can he convince people to worship the beast? Through false prophecy. How many today can get some to leave their church that they join being led by God through a prophecy? Oh my God, when someone speaks into your life, they are touching you. It's like letting someone touch you. They are imparting into you. How many let these voices or seeds into them and now they're confused? You don't know if you're saved. If you're not saved, you don't know if you're supposed to be doing this. You don't know where, where you're supposed to be. If you're supposed to leave or either stay with your spouse. Those who have itching ears will be deceived, not just the world. Oh no, the Bible declares in 2 Timothy 4 and 3, for such a time, a time for a time is here, it's coming, it was prophesied. When people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching, but with itching ears, they will gather around themselves. What does that mean? Link up with, find a commonality, someone they can identify with, false teachers to suit their own passions. Key word, their own, not God's. How many today see prophetic posted on a live or a conference and don't seek the Lord as to whether or not they should enter? How many want to consult a prophet that isn't even in their house before they consult their own shepherd and before they consult God? You can't be more loyal to the prophet than to God. You can't desire the, more, the prophetic more than you desire God. More than your desire to sit with him, to know his word, and to learn of him, which gives you the insight and the ability to identify what is and is not of him. First John 4 and 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So they will be deceived through false miracles, false prophecy, and through blasphemy. We will see blasphemy. These are the signs of the times. Hallelujah. This is what we look to or for to identify these things. Second Peter says, but false prophets also arose among the people just as there were false, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. What are heresies? A formal denial. A form of denial or doubt of the core doctrine of Christianity. For example, some of these things are God doesn't exist. Jesus is not the only way. Jesus came. He lived. He was a prophet, but not the son of God. He didn't die or he wasn't raised for the dead. This is a heresy. He, if, any, if any of these were false, then we would still be headed to hell. By default, not because uh, 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 of you know, because I cost by, by default, because of the sin Adam, because of the sin of Adam, if these things never took place, if his death, his burial, his resurrection never happened, we will be hopeless. But we know this isn't true. But this is what the false teacher preaches. It doesn't matter if they were once a preacher and once uh, won millions of souls and now they so, so-called awoke now. Now they so-called got this great revelation that's not biblical. Now all of a sudden... They have been waking up from some sort of strange vision, vision or dream that now, it now uh, is, is defying or going against the very word that was taught. It doesn't matter what they did. What are they doing now? What is their life? What is their life like now? Is it, is it lining up? Are they lining up? Are they speaking what the word of God speaks? It does not matter how popular. It doesn't matter how many followers. Is it biblical? Is it biblical? Is it biblical? You can believe what you will and all roads lead to Jesus. Lies. No, there is only one way. You can worship something or someone else and claim to be his in the end. You believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and we believe he is the son of God and born of a virgin. Why? Because if he had an earthly father, his blood would not be divine. It would not have the ability to save us from our sins. Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 says, since the children have flesh and blood, he too.
two shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had, be, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are tempted. Amen. So Satan operates in the world along with other principalities a part of his kingdom and he wages war against the saints of God and works to deceive those under his rule. Now, how do we know this to be true? Because we don't, you know, a lot of they, you know, a lot of people that hear, you know, his voices or their pastors say certain things, and they're like, "Oh, I'm just gonna sit up here and eat this." That's why we have the word. We all have access to his word. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you, we know those who will be deceived, but who are under the rule of Satan. Let's go to the word. Matthew 12, 15 says, after Jesus healed someone with an evil spirit, he knew what some were thinking, and he said. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? In the last teaching, Kingdom Citizens, I explained what a, king, a kingdom was and I spoke of the domain of darkness that the Lord Jesus Christ saved us from. So who does Satan rule? Now we established that he indeed does has a, have a kingdom, a place where he rules. Who does he rule over? Unbelievers. Some will say, well, I don't believe in anything. <laughs> I'm not branded. I'm an individual. I don't belong to no club or no religion. I don't believe in anything or being a part of nothing. But what those who are lost, as we once were, don't understand is that you don't not believe. Catch this. You don't not believe because you choose not to. It is because you're blinded. You're blinded. We were once blinded. It's not because God is invisible that they cannot see him. He, uh, uh, they cannot see him because they lack faith. That allows them to see the evidence of his existence. Some say it is illogical to believe in a God you have never seen, but it is illogical to believe that the sky and the moon and the planets got there themselves. If you only believe in science and you ask questions to find your logical explanation, you will continue to go around and around in circles and come back to the first question because God is the answer. God is the period. He is the explanation of the beginning and the end because he is the beginning and the end. He is alpha and he is omega. The result of their blindness, as was ours, goes all the way back to Genesis when Eve was in the garden and she was approached by Satan who took on the form of a snake. This was the first deception of humanity. Satan has ruled over the unbelieving and the sons of disobedience, okay? The sons of disobedience referred in, two, in Ephesians 2 and 2, which says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, past tense, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience of what? Of natural laws, uh, putting trash on the ground, running red lights? No, God's laws and commands. The sons of disobedience are those who have not trusted Christ as Lord, meaning in his death that he's the son of God. They do not trust or believe that he is Christ, that he's Lord or he's Savior. Colossians 3 and 6 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetiveness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once, past tense, walked when you were living with them. Who is them? The sons of disobedience. So right there, the Bible is declaring and showing that there is a difference between the church. There is a difference between the redeemed. There is a difference between those who are holy. There is a difference between those who are peculiar. 
2 Corinthians 4 and 4 says the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the face of God, Emmanuel. So before I go any further, I want to explain why we're going into identifying Satan, because you have some today that believe we don't need to talk about Satan. Why are we talking about him? We don't need to talk about all this demonic stuff in this kingdom and this doom. Why are we even discussing him? Focus on Jesus. Focus on the light. Focus on the bright. Look to the sun. Who in the world does not study their enemy? OK, some of you all, you're Marvel fans or you when you were younger, you may have watched Superman. You may have watched, you know, in every cartoon nowadays, you know, they have a good and they have an evil. And, you know, and you remember how they studied Superman and they found out what that Superman was weak, you know, off of what kryptonite. OK, and then um, you, you go to many other different, you know, ones that you see. And of course, the you see that their enemy actually studies them but the truth is is that the enemy has studied humanity for ages he's been studying humans hallelujah and human behavior before science knew it was a such thing or psychologists knew that it was a such thing as human behavior hallelujah so you cannot operate in your own intelligence against demonic intelligence you have to fight and you have to war and you have to counter attack hallelujah with the word of god hallelujah with your spirit weapons the weapons of our warfare are not carnal saints hallelujah glory to God because they don't work so he's been studying humanity for ages seeing what they like they dislike and when the word took on flesh Satan thought that he would be bound or overcome by the same desires as Adam or David or Noah or the kings he had su subdued before. For it is written in the book of Isaiah 4.12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? You weakened the nations. How did he weaken the nations? He made them liable to destruction and damnation. Hell was our destination before we could think wrong or do wrong or dress revealing. We were born into sin and shaped into iniquity because of disobedience because of rebellion when we look at nations as it relates to health or a body what brings health to the body the immune system a healthy body is exposed to germs and pathologies daily but as long as the immune system is functioning your body is resistant to the germs and viruses but when the body practices or engages in things that weaken the immune system, the body cannot fight off these things that it was created to fight off. The virus isn't what has plagued the world or this nation, but it is sin and rebellion against God. We are exposed to all types of ideas in and through every form of the entertainment, media, literature, culture, even our institutions have stripped any form of allegiance or adherence to the word of God, the true and living God. Hallelujah. Turning away from God sickens our societies. This is how a body is weakened, but we... We who are called by his name were created to be set apart because we are those who bear the marks of Christ. We are the ones who bear the marks of God. And Jesus is our example that we should follow his steps because Satan could not cause Jesus to sin. Jesus knew Satan. He was there when he was created. He is an enemy of Christ. And those who come to Christ becomes enemies of Satan. You're wondering why is it so hard? As soon as I came to the Lord, it seemed like everything was going better out there. It was not. It's a smoke show. Ask God to remove the blinders. It's no way that you can be in Christ and things are worse than when you were without Christ. Hallelujah. To, uh, hallelujah. Glory to God. It is a lie. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You were just on the side. You were just on the side. Listen, if you're on a gang, hallelujah. If you're in a gang or you're a part, hallelujah, of a crew that, that's vicious and they're going after someone else, you're the part of the ones that's, that's causing all the ruckus. You're the one that's on the side that's causing all the intimidation. So you come on the other side and you come out and now you're actually feeling the brunt and the force, hallelujah, of what you were causing. So his enemies become our enemies, but Jesus overcame him 
And those who come to Jesus are given knowledge of the adversary as well as power over him. Not only power, but not only power over Satan, but over all the principalities he commands that bring sickness, that bring disease, oppression, and deception. What boxer prepares for a fight and they don't study their opponent? opponent. They don't have all this confidence where they're saying, oh, I know how to fight. You know, I done knocked out 30 people already. You know what I'm saying? I done, you know, it, it don't matter. Bring them on. I don't got to look at no tape. I don't need to study nobody. You know what I'm saying? I know these muscles. I know what I've been eating. I know how strong I am. That is unwise to have that much confidence in self. Hallelujah. A smart boxer, even though he eats well, even though he's had 20, uh, 20 to zero uh, uh, TKOs, he didn't get it hallelujah by by just trusting in himself he studied he studies he's going to study the moves of his opponent he's going to see if he jabs with the right hand more than the left hand he's going to see what his boxing style is he you come out here boxing and this dude come out here with some bruce leroy type of stuff from the last dragon and start blowing on you and you like what's up god what's going on hallelujah you know what I'm saying? You know, you don't know if he kickbox, if he's going to kick you, if he's going to fight with his feet, if he had arms. You don't know what special techniques he has. You get the point. You want to study. And this is what we do. What corporation gets ready to go into a business and go into a region and not study the people there to know what other stores are there? In this case, churches. If you are in Christ, the enemy knows your church. If you're a pastor, if you're an apostle, the enemy knows your church hallelujah and the deeds of your church because you bear the marks of christ he knows you as an individual because you bear the marks of christ and we will get to that after this but it's necessary for some of us to know because the lord spoke to me and told me that there are principalities assigned over regions and you can tell by the state or the condition of the region what the demonic influence is those who discern spirits can identify the crisis in a region without seeing the news. I remember when Tony and I were going to look for houses and we looked into this, looked at this house and we walked through and I was like, okay, you know, not just something, something is not off. He began to tell me that there was a, a, a high, um, high level witchcraft in that area, that there were a lot or many, like it was a coven in, in that area. And I was like, I already wasn't feeling the house. I just didn't like it. And then, you know, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit reveals this to me. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's why. Another time we are looking for a house. We go to the next house. And it falls in my spirit. There are um, sexual predators in this area. You would not feel comfortable letting your children go out. And we're not talking about people and their behavior. We're talking about the ruling principalities. When you go into areas and you see a lot of poverty, when you go into areas and you see a lot of crime, hallelujah, glory to God, you are looking at, you are identifying the ruling principality in that area. Hallelujah. Now we are scared. We ain't never scared. All right. Hallelujah. But we want to be in the know. Not having fear is not going out here and doing something crazy. Again, not studying your opponent and not trusting God. God. Hallelujah. You're moving in wisdom. You're moving in the in the in, in faith. You are moving when you're trusting God. Some people will die prematurely because they lied on God and said that they were operating in faith when God will, will speak to you and say, Don't go here, don't move there, don't marry that person, don't drive over there, don't go over that bridge, don't go there today. Okay? Hallelujah. Glory to God. You have to know when to appropriate what, what type of faith we operating in today. Faith in hearing you tell me not to go or faith in going regardless of what's ahead of me because I'm trusting that you are going to protect me and you are going to cover me. I'm not switching my flight out of fear. I'm switching my flight because I've been given divine insight on demonic plans and strategies. You won't get me because my God is a revealer. Hallelujah, the prophet of God, hallelujah, when, when, when the army was coming against Elijah and all of that, the Holy Spirit told them where to go to. He told them where to go to, even though he said, open up this, my servant's eyes because he a little scary, Jesus. You know, God opened up his eyes, you know, because he a little scary. And when he opened up his servant's eyes, he saw, you know, a host of chariots and fire. But even he didn't have to use those chariots. He said, look, just in case you scared, know who I got with me. But we're going to turn and we're going to go this way because by this time tomorrow, we are going to have the enemy spools. We're going to have more than what we could ever have thought of. We aren't even going to be able to see 
excel because everybody is going to have everything that they need. And so, I was picking up on the demonic activity in the region. Like I said, we aren't scared, but we follow the voice and the leading of the Holy Spirit. When you are breaking ground and taking territory, you need to know the ruling principalities in that area so you can take dominion. You need to know, hallelujah, how to war in that community or even where you live at, saints of God, not just the pastors, hallelujah, but you need to know because you didn't just move in that area just by chance. You need to know that community that you have been assigned to so that it can heal and it can grow and be free from oppression of that ruler. You you aren't even in a house or a neighborhood, hallelujah, because you just liked it because they had the lights outside. Don't you know that he placed that desire for you in you since the foundation because he saw April, he saw June, he saw August, he saw January 2021, and he put in you a desire to have this type of house so you can have dominion over that area. Do you know that the enemy gets mad when you move? Some of you have seen manifestations and you are out here in the street about to put your um, slippers on, you go into the mailbox and you upset. She don't speak, so I don't speak. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. God bless, girl. You know the girl down the street. She don't even speak. You don't even know that's an assignment. You've been put there. Hallelujah. Glory to God to be a light, to be an example. God may open up a door. You don't know why that girl is scowling. She could be in the house getting beat. She could have went through a hard life and going through a hard life now, but because you coming down on her level and you're not taking the authority and dominion in the area, in the the territory that God has placed you in, you didn't miss a whole assignment trying to carry it out in church on an auxiliary with time off for being nice to your neighbor in your church and you're not nice to your neighbor in your neighborhood. Hallelujah. So you need to know why what's coming your way and coming up on your phone is coming up on your phone. You need to know why he approached you, why she is taking a sudden interest in you, man of God. And if the Lord is sending you to a region, it's because he has given you power. You need to be able to identify where the offer came from because some are temptations and were created for you to lust or desire what is being shown that is not the will of God. We just read that he took on a form of a snake. He came as an angel of light, right? He presents opportunities. He offers wealth. He even tries to plant seeds of confusion as it pertains to who God said you are, identity, who he has called you and identified you and as the temp and, and the temptation of Christ and Matthew 4 and 4, 1 through 11 is proof of this. The Bible said after fasting for 40 days. And 40 nights, he was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He asked him to tell uh, uh, the stones to become bread to break the fast he was on. He told him to throw himself down from the highest point of the temple because it is written he will command. This is what Satan is telling Jesus. For it is written that he will command his angels concerning you. He tried to deceive Jesus. <coughs> the blood of Jesus. With the word. But we have to know God's word in order to discern and test the spirit, which en enables us to identify the truth. And when someone is twisting the word of God for personal gain, he was tempting Jesus with suicide. But the Lord said it is also written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor and said, this has been given to me, given, given. That means somebody gave it to you, right? And I can give it to anyone I want. This will I give to you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So based upon the word of God, we know Satan influences people. He sends bribes and causes them to bow down to him. Even when they don't believe they are taking a bribe from him. Even when they don't believe that he's the one who offered it such as popularity, fame, and power. But this power that has been given to him is limited. So those who are deceived and fall for the bribes and are selling their souls are selling themselves short because he has blinded them with the little things this world has to offer that seem so huge when you have 
very little. Bowing down to Satan for what God has already given them and given them dominion over. So many are looking to belong, trying to find their identity. Some are looking for a new identity, not just because of the brokenness in their families, but because of the brokenness in this world as a result of sin. Satan causes the blindness that keeps all who are lost from knowing their true identity, which is in Christ and through deception. He comes with an offer of every thing but God. He comes with what God created and not God, the source. He requires men to soul, sell their souls and bow down to him to gain something the Lord can give and also take away. So he going to give it to you, but God can take it away. He can give it to you, but there's no guarantee of you keeping it or how long you get to hold it. Deception. He offers addictions in the form of peace. He offers lust in the form of satisfaction. He presents rebellion as independence and he steals from you and then bribes you into serving him for it. But that's like stealing something from you and offering it back to you. Peace is yours without the substitutes. Satisfaction is yours without destroying your temple, which is the true house of God. Why settle for little power? When through Christ, God gives you power that so surpasses Satan's. Because those who are lost, as we once were, are blinded by the lust, the desire, and the needs of the flesh. The needs of this world, the everyday needs that we have. Water, clothes, all these things that God provided in Eden, right? And that he promises to, to, and to provide. Even, even in this time, right? Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, but I walk by the spirit, but I say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do, the things that are right. The things that please God, the things that honor God, the things that are acceptable to him. We're singing this song. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. And some don't even realize what that means. What that statement means actually means he has life and death powers and principalities under his feet and all who have sold their souls and lived as they choose to as they chose to and didn't acknowledge him although they branded themselves with tattoos of scriptures and sang about him if not if it is not in their heart and they did not turn to him and from evil they will be lost the desire for power, influence, mansions, jobs, and even some who feel that they're powerful because they find power in their so-called decision of not becoming slaves to Christ, not being one who can be fooled by you this Christianity stuff. But in the end, if they don't come to Jesus, which we pray that some will, who? They will find out who and what is indeed foolishness. First Corinthians 1, 26 and 7 says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were. When you were called, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were noble of birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly and despised things, people of the world that are not to bring to nothing that things that are so no flesh can glory or boast in his presence. So although Satan has power that's limited and authority in the current world system in which we exist, his mind, his power is limited always under the sovereign control of God. And God has made it clear that there is only one way to escape the power of Satan's dominion, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. John 1 and 12 says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become 
children of God. And when God gives us access, we cannot be denied. And when we believe in him, we go back to his original plan for our lives and our identity is changed. It's changed. It's changed. You are no longer tempted to find your identity or seek to find who you are from outside sources. Everything made and created has an identifier to trace the source of the manufacturer. And God is our manufacturer. I knew you all had it. And our instructions make and model are found in our manual, which is the Bible. And it reads in Genesis 1, 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. By the very word, the Ruach of God, which is the breath of God, every cell or system, skeletal and muscle system was created. The brain and the nervous system. He created the external and internal functions of the body. He created the system of blood flow in the body so that it would bring oxygen and nutrients to all parts of the body. So wherever the blood flows, wherever the blood flows, wherever the blood flows, there would be life. I remember watching this movie. And at this movie, this real account of the ERs and the woman, she was sitting there and, and everybody kept passing her. But the woman, she said, okay, how are you feeling? She said, my arm feels numb. And so she checked her arm and she said, it's ice cold. We need to get her in here. She even checked her pulse. There was no pulse. There was no pulse because there was no blood flow. There was no blood flow. There was a, a, a blood clot in her arm. And she said, if we don't get this blood flowing... Catch this. If we don't get this flowing, this blood flowing in this arm, we're going to have to amputate it. So wherever there is no blood flow, then there is amputation. Wherever there's no blood flow, hallelujah, then it is cut off. Whoever's not covered in the blood, whoever doesn't come through by way of the blood is cut off. As it is in the natural soul, is it in the spirit? Because in the blood, there is life. And the blood supplies the oxygen and the nutrients throughout the body, Hallelujah. So that it may live. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Whenever the blood stops flowing to one part of the body, it dies and it has to be let go. I mean, park right here because this is Holy Week. Hallelujah. This is the time where we, we celebrate. Hallelujah. The blood. We celebrate the blood. Hallelujah. Because of the blood, we have new life. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we have new life. And we need to tell our children about new life. I'm so excited, hallelujah, that we get the chance, hallelujah, to really honor the sacrifice of God and really sit in and be shut in, hallelujah, to give him the focus and the attention that he deserves. Even when it comes down I pray that God even turn our ways around as it relates to how some of us even entertain our children doing resurrection. Hallelujah. Why can't we incorporate things that talk about the blood? Why can't we incorporate things that talk about his sacrifice? Hallelujah. If you're going to do an egg, put a little cross on the egg. Do a little teaching. Hallelujah. Everything. We, we want the children to have fun. Hallelujah. We don't want to tell them the gory details. I understand that it was bloody. I understand that it wasn't pretty. I understand Understand that an innocent man died. I understand that it's not a, a pretty story, but yet and still we want the story of how hallelujah slaves, hallelujah, were taken from their homeland. We can tell them about how the drug, the blood ran down their back and how their backs was opened up. We can talk about the wars and the civil wars that took peace a place so that civilians would have the right, hallelujah, to walk freely in their country. But you need to tell them and you need to remember that a man, hallelujah, named Jesus Christ, he came and he shed his blood. He was beaten. He was bruised for your iniquities and the chastisement upon him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You need to tell your children about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and tell them why they can live, why they have, they can lift their hands in freedom. Tell them about the men that died, hallelujah, and were hung and were stoned, hallelujah, glory to God, and whipped bearing the marks of Christ for your, for your salvation, for your freedom. Tell them about the man who gave them access to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
So wherever the blood is flowing, there is life because life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. The blood functions to give us life and the blood functions to identify us. Adam and Eve were not just shells when God created them. When God created them, the structure of DNA was created. I had to look this thing up. I said, Lord, okay. He said, look up. Hallelujah. Go and look up how many uh, how many um, DNA cells are in each person. And so I looked it up. So that meant Means that when he when he created Adam and Eve, three billion DNA letters were in Adam, and three billion DNA letters were created in Eve. When he created man and woman, he gave them us humanity the ability to also produce others after our own kind. Psalms one thirty nine thirteen and sixteen says, "For you have for you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made." Ma- Marvelous are the work are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, hallelujah, being yet unformed in your book. They were all written the days fashioned for me, when as yet they were none written, because I had not been born yet. Job 14 and 5 says, A person's days are determined, were determined, past tense. The number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. He cannot go past the time that you have spoken. Matthew 10 30 says, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Hallelujah. Your entire makeup all the way down to your fingerprints. Have you ever looked at them? Have you ever looked at your fingerprints and how they swirl and the patterns of them? This is the work of God. This is the work of your God. Fingerprints appear on the fetus about four months into pregnancy and it's not just a cute little design. It isn't something to help you to grip your food like scientists thought you once believed when they were searching for the purpose of fingerprints. But it wasn't until 1901 that fingerprints were used as a valid police procedure. Before fingerprinting, a system of identification, uh, identification called the, Ber- the Bertillion system was used. In order to identify a person, they used the length or breadth of the skull, the length um, of each foot, the forearm, to the elbow, to the tip of the middle finger. They then measured the middle finger. Then they measured the exact ear size. But in 1903, that system failed because there were two men with the exact same measurements. They were identical, almost identical, which caused them to look for a more accurate identifier. Later, it was discovered that fingerprints could positively identify one person from the other. And just as our fingerprints identify us, they trace us back to the existence of God. If you touch something or you are touched by something, they or it can be identified. One of the things that investigators do when they want to trace a person or thing responsible for what has happened, they get what? Fingerprints by putting down an adhesive powder on whatever is down and the oil that's from your fingerprints or whatever you touch once that powder gets on it then it raises up the fingerprints and they do what is called a dusting hallelujah how many of you hallelujah have had a dusting in your life you can look over your past you can look hallelujah some of the scars on your body that's a dusting that's the hand of God he's showing you what he brought you through he's showing you where he's taking you to hallelujah glory to God when you're looking and you're saying God I don't know how I made it this far I don't know how me and my children made it this far hallelujah that's a dusting you're seeing the hand of God mighty works identify the finger of God he alone is responsible for what science cannot explain Psalms 8 and 3 says Psalm 8 and 3 says when I consider your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have ordained. Isaiah 64 and 8 says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter and all of us are the work of your hand. When we recall Moses going up to Mount Sinai, it was the finger of God that wrote on the tablets of stone, which are the Ten Commandments. Exodus 8 and 19 says, then the magicians, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this 
is the finger of God. His works separate him from the sorcerers, from the wizards, and from the idols in the land. No one is greater. No one is more terrifying. His works are indefinable. His works are indeniable. He does the impossible and cannot be compared to any other. Who can create from nothing? No one but our God. He is God. His authority is a symbol of his identity. Jesus said in Luke 11 and 20, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I'm going to say that again because I like how that sounds, Jesus. I like how it sounds. But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. This is how you know that the Lord is at work. The Bible said these signs shall follow those who what? Who what church? Believe. They are the fingerprints of God separating the psychics from the prophets. Deuteronomy 8.22 says when the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, not the but a, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. What does presumptuously, presumptuously mean? It means when somebody takes liberties too boldly, taking for granted access to someone or the power to do something, abusing the power, abusing the authority, moving hastily in that authority just because you have a voice, speaking ahead of God. They are overconfident or even acting rudely or inappropriately. The Bible says you should not be afraid of him. So this implies that you should fear those who come in the name of the Lord. This does not mean that you fear the flesh, that you feel the person, but you fear God because the message that's coming from the pastor, the evangelist, because we think that the word of God, when we talk about this is only through the prophet. Okay. Oh no, they're just saying that we, we get so busy looking at the vessel and say, how do they have the right to tell me how to, how to live? I know you're trying to dissect them like a frog. Come on, somebody. You're trying to, the, the, you know, and I'm not talking about you, you, you dismiss people life. Come on. We talk about identity. No, but I'm talking about when you know someone is living holy and it's not even about that. You just trying to find any type of way to reject the word. Uh oh. You trying to find any type of way to not receive this word and say, well, hey, you ain't and you ain't and you ain't perfect. The word of God is the one correcting you. The word of God is the one that is revealing what his will is for your life. How many of you sent your children to say something to your other child? Clean up. Then clean up. You ain't hear what I told you? Oh, they told. No, I sent the message. I sent the message. Now, if you know your, 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 your sister or your brother, they just trying to get you to do something. Mommy said, you know, um, clean my toys up. Please, sit down. Don't fear them. You know, go while your mother ain't telling them to clean up something that they were supposed to clean up. Don't be afraid of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. But those who come in the name of the Lord, you should not, did not, should not disregard God's mouthpieces because they bear the marks of Christ. They come with his message and God's voices are able to speak what he speaks, life and death, because they declare the will of the Lord. Not, oh, I can just declare death because you made me mad. I can just declare death or destruction because it's some type of power in me. No, I'm receiving the word of the Lord and the word of the Lord is going to align with what his word says. And when God comes forward, it's with a redemptive purpose. Even when he sent Nona, Jonah to send judgment to Nineveh and say, look, y'all got 40 days to get it right. Or all y'all up, y'all about to go up out of here. Destruction going to come. It's about to go down. Building's about to fall. Everybody, everybody died. Everybody, I'm, I'm just, I'm just telling y'all, get right. Even that was a redemptive per, was a redemptive purpose. He was telling them, turn to me, and you're going to be safe. Should they fear Jonah? No, they should fear God, who has the ability to bring His word that He spoke through Jonah to pass. Hallelujah! So Jesus said, by the finger of God, He cast out demons. So. Those who come in his name will bear witness to his power and his mighty works. They shall speak a thing and it shall come to pass because the Lord has spoken it. These are his. We can identify the works of God because they are supernatural. They align with his word and his will. They work out for our good and again, therefore, a redemptive purpose. And those who do his works are also identified by and with 
him. He is creator of all and he knows all are his. God doesn't need you, you know, to, to put your fingerprint on a little black stamp or whatever. Stamp right here so we can go. He don't need your social security uh, uh, number to identify you. For it is written in Jeremiah 1 and 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I called you. I chose your purpose. I put the gifts in you. I decided your race. I decided your complexion that you don't like. I decided your eye color. I decided, hallelujah, your, your hair texture and the limb. I decided your destiny, how you would speak and your calling for my purpose. And it will bless you and others. And it will also glorify me. He created this world and all that we see in such a way that no one or nothing could take the credit and when they tried they will never find the answers because it is a mystery to them because they reject God but he placed his own set of identifiers upon us and it's in our spiritual DNA and our natural DNA which is found in our blood in the blood somebody say in the blood but not the red blood cells this thing took me out right here when God showed me because when he told me to go look for the DNA he showed me something else the DNA is not found in the white and the red blood cells but it's found and the white blood cells. So as I was looking up and searching, they said that they put the blood, uh, say if you want to do paternity tests or like I said, it's a crime. They're trying to find out who's the one responsible, the true identity, the true identity. What they do is they draw blood and they put the blood in this thing that spins the blood around and it separates the red blood cells from the white blood cells. And then they put chemicals inside the white blood cells and then the last little chemical is some alcohol and then it causes the white blood cell to, to pop up and, 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 and reveal the identity and it turns into this little blob. So it reminded me of when God spun us around. When God turned some of our lives around, when we were going into another direction so we could come back to him and find our true identity. Isaiah 1 and 18 says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you getting it? When you go through the blood, you find your true identity. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not in the red blood, but in the white blood. He said that though your sins may be red as crimson, he will wash you white as snow. When you are cleansed, you now see your true identity in Christ. Now you can be identified. Hallelujah. Scripture goes on to say that though they are red like crimson. I will make them white as wool. I will make them white as wool. Hallelujah. Psalms 51 and 7 says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. It's not about color. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. My true identity will come forth because it is found in you. And the only way to see the blood is to be cut. The only way to see blood is you got to die. And in our walk with Christ, we must both do both. We must be cut and we must die. We must be cut and we must die. Hallelujah. You got to be okay with the flesh being cut, with old things being cut off. That way, if, with old things being cut off so that the blood can flow. You have to cut off the things, hallelujah, that cause you to stray away from Christ. You have to allow God to cut off those things in your life, hallelujah, that cause you to displease him so that your true identity can come forth. So the blood can flow. So that you can live. Cut off these things so you can live. Die so you can live. You can only be a new creature unless you have new life, new blood. Hallelujah. You can only be a new creature if you die. You have to die in order to know your true identity in Christ. You're not only going to die once. Oh no, you're going to die daily. You're going to die daily. Colossians 3 and 3 says to the believer for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. The Lord had it so that DNA will be found in the white blood cells to prophetically declare his transforming power. It traces us back to him. He lets us know that we are his and our identity can only be found in him. It is through the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. It is through the cleansing through the blood of Jesus. Remember the blood has life in it and Jesus came to give us a supernatural blood transfusion which gives us new life, new identity, new new hope, new purpose. 
because of the blood of Jesus. Our spiritual DNA is changed. We now take on his identity. Sometimes we don't even look the same. We don't think the same. We don't desire the same things. We have been, been transformed by the power of the blood. We've been transformed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, but he who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Galatians 3, 26 says, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Somebody say sons. Hallelujah. The word son appears in the New Testament. 422 times and at least half the time it refers to Christ God is the father and Christ Jesus is his son God himself is a family the word translated and I'm not I mean the word the word word is translated in the Greek translated in the Greek is logos meaning spokesman word the word word logos meaning is spokesman word or revelatory thought so then we have to ask not what but who is logos it is jesus he is the spokesman he said in john 8 18 i am the one that bears witness to myself and the father who sent me to sent me testifies of me he is the word the logos john 1 verse 14 says and the word logos was made flesh man and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father the word begotten means fathered to produce as offspring so when the word became the son, God became the father. Jesus was born, died, and was resurrected. And through faith in him, we too are identified and called sons of God. Through faith. Romans 8, 14 says, for many are as led by the spirit of God. They are who? Sons of God. We spoke on this earlier. Those who resist the devil. Those who meditate on the word of God. Those who are doers of the word, those who make him a priority and put him above all, all else. I didn't say never did anything wrong. When I said strive, I mean striving to live for God, resisting the devil, resisting temptation, loving God, loving his word. Hallelujah. Those who put him above all else, those who respond to the spirit of the Lord's leading are sons of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. Ephesians 4, 24 says, And to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So we are now identified with Christ. And this is by faith with demonstration, meaning our lives are changed. You, can look, you can't look at someone and, and see their DNA or look at the small lines on their fingers and say, oh, this your daddy. You know, that's your mother. So some things are hidden to the natural eye and some things are not. But as it is in the natural, so is it in the spirit. There are natural and spiritual marks that identify us as sons of God. There are some things that we may have experienced as children that let us know that God wanted to do something in and through our lives before we came to him. I remember being 13 years old i remember uh the lord speaking to me when i was younger you know saying little things you know like you're going to marry a preacher had no idea you know what a preacher was what they did i remember the lord showing me different visions of things that would take place 
uh, in my life. I remember him just sweetly and gently calling me. Even when I didn't understand salvation or even understand, you know, that I had been marked for, marked by God because I'm not talking about, you know, just a, a physical mark that's somewhere on your body or, 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 or a birthmark. There are some things that you can probably attest to that has taken place in your life where you just knew there were certain things that some of us, some of us didn't have the same experiences and that is okay. I remember sitting with a friend on the front steps and we were listening to music and I remember he always liked to, you know, look at the look at the award shows and anything and all of that. And I'm not saying anything is wrong with, you know, looking at the award shows and stuff like that. But even though I was not in Christ, I wasn't even going to church. I'm the we're the church, right? But because we're familiar with the term the church, that's why I'm saying that. I wasn't even going. But there's certain things that I just didn't have a desire to do. I was still doing a lot of other stuff. So I'm not saying, you know, like, oh, you know, I, that wasn't me. It's just certain things where he put spiritual hedges because he knew how much I could take, how, how far he wanted me to go. Some of us push those habits, uh, those hedges. We push them back. But at the same time, God is faithful. God is merciful. God is loving and God is kind and he continues to draw us back to him. And I remember not having a desire and I said, you don't get tired sometimes. And I don't even know why I was saying that. You don't get tired sometimes of listening to this and, and doing the stuff that you're doing. And he was like, no. And I was like, why do I even feel like this? Why do I even feel like this? I remember even a time of being with, you know, an ex-boyfriend that I was seeing at, at the time for years. And at this time I had backslidden. I was away from God, away from the church, no longer answering the phone when people were calling me, you know, asking me where we were. And then this boyfriend who was not spiritual at all, ne you know, never went to church, never showed any type of interest in God or the things of God. Ask me if I want to go to the movie. Sure, I want to go to the movies. We're going to see this new movie that came out called The Passion of Christ. I'm like, The Passion of Christ? This is strange. This is really weird that you would want to go to see something like this. He didn't even know who I was. I didn't even have an idea of who I was. But I was brought up somewhat in the church. And I'm like, God... All right, so I go and I see this movie and I'm in there weeping and he's sitting there like, come on, you got to watch it. And I'm trying to close my eyes. No, you got to watch it. You got to look at this or whatever. And it didn't seem to take the same effect as it had on me as it, as it had on him. And I was weeping uncontrollably and I was saying, God, I know this isn't right. I, I, we got back to the house and I said, do you have a Bible in here somewhere? Do you have a Bible? He was like, yes, yeah, a Bible in here. Isn't it funny how we don't read Bibles? You know, how some don't even believe or have a close relationship, but out of ritual, we always know to keep one. Hallelujah. But even in that, I was able to have access to the word. And I looked in there because I said, I have to find his crucifixion. I have to find out if what they're depicting in this movie is truth. Is this truth? Did this really happen the way that this movie said that it did? Was he really tormented like this? Did he really go through these long hours of suffering? Was he really treated this way? Was he really bruised like this? Was he really sped upon? And I looked and I couldn't believe my eyes. It was exactly as what was shown. And at that moment, something in me, something in me, although I didn't turn right away, God was showing me the very fact that, that his sacrifice had that type of impact on me was showing that there was life, that there was life yet still in me, tracing me back to the father. That regardless of what I was participating in at that time, that he had still set me apart from my mother's womb. I just had to accept him. 
I had to stop denying him. I had to stop hiding from him. I had to stop trying to do things my way. I had to allow him to come into my life and to fill every single, uh, every single void. I had to stop running. He had set a mark upon me. I remember being in the club, dancing. I'm trying to make a point to show you that you are never too far from God. You are never too far. You are never too far from God, from God's grace, from God's love. You're never too far. And so I was in the club out in DC and I remember dancing and I remember the whole room being dark and it's like everything went into slow motion and I just felt the floorboards moving up and down and I'm looking around and I heard a voice saying, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. And I was like, God, what is happening to me? What's going on? He continued to pursue me. You can be around others. And it's, and it's not saying that they won't get the call or they won't hear the voice of the Lord calling on them. We're all called at different times. But I feel in my spirit there are some who have gone astray and they have forgotten who that they who they are and they believe that they are no longer sons, daughters of God because of what they have found themselves entangled in. But God is still calling you. He says to you, remember. Remember the encounters that I had with you. Remember the visions that I gave you. Remember and do not ignore that conviction that you feel when you are amongst your peers. Don't ignore it. God has placed his mark upon you. He's calling you. He's calling you back to a relationship, not back to church. Stop saying when the church doors open, you are the church. Your heart is the altar. Your heart is the altar. And those of us who know that we are his, we have to walk in who we are. Those of you who have had good parents, you felt safety with your parents. You felt safe with your parents. When you are in the house, you aren't afraid if you had good parents. I understand some are struggling because they didn't have good parents. They might have parents who had starved them. They might have had parents that starved them of love, that starved them of affection, that have starved them. And some are trying to find their identity because they have been adopted and they feel like, if I don't know my father, I don't know my mother. Yes, I was brought up and I was loved, but I don't know who I am. I don't know where I got my gifts from. I don't know where I got my eye color from. I don't know who has the same hair. When I look at these people, I appreciate you, but can you understand? I just don't know who I am. I'm here to tell you who you are. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. You got your eyes from your father. You got your hair from your father. You got your gifts from your father. Your parents got theirs from him. He created you. No more crisis over identity. He has created you. He gave you life. No more searching. The Lord says he's going to bring satisfaction to someone who has been in denial, someone who has been starved. He says, I am your sustainer. I am going to satisfy you so much so that you no longer look. Because someone has been reaching out and reaching out and trying to make a relationship. And I'm not saying stop, but God says that he wants you to be satisfied because it's taking a toll over your mind. It's taking a toll over your body because you're continuing to function and do even though you feel like the love is not being reciprocated and you're not understanding why. But God said that I have placed you. Do not get, get upset or frustrated or depressed because you were born in this situation because you were born for 
a greater purpose than to be the child of people that don't want you. God has you here because there's a purpose and there's a plan for your life that's far greater than anything that you experience. That's far greater than your ab ab abandonment. Hallelujah. Not yours. The abandonment. Because you're not, you're not receiving that. You're taking off of those labels. You're taking off of every label that you've identified yourself with. You're taking off weak. You're taking off vulnerable. You're taking off orphan. You're taking off prostitute. You're taking off evil. You're taking off our, um, our attitude problem. You are taking it off. You now identify whew, with Christ. The one who called you, the one who saved you, the one who delivered you, the one who set you free, the one who shed his blood to give you new life so that you would find your true identity, your true purpose and a place to belong. You don't have to search in the beds of anybody else anymore. I understand you don't have to search, hallelujah, for all these substitutions, human or thing, hallelujah, glory to God. You know where your source is. It's in Jesus, your creator. Every vehicle has a VIN number. And of course, as I said, we aren't vehicles, we are persons. But as it is in the natural, so is it in the spirit. We are the vehicles that God uses in the earth. And every vehicle has that VIN number that traces it back, traces it back to its manufacturer. You have to go beyond the mother and father. This is how you're going to be delivered from every curse, every demonic dysfunction that has held you back from becoming who Christ has identified you. No longer receive the things that you've heard when you were younger. Some are older and still hearing the things that their mother or their father said even before they're speaking. They hear their voice from the grave. They're hearing a voice that's no longer there telling them, well, you know that you ain't never going to do this because me and your father, you know that we, you know, our family, we just don't do this. We just don't get married. We just do that. No, the devil is a liar. I am a new creature in Christ. I'm a new creature. Hallelujah. Another generation a new bloodline has come out of me a holy generation one will go forward one who will trust God one who will love God and go on to do the very thing that he has called us to do your son of God your daughters of God you no longer have to seek or do things that you felt as if you had to do to be accepted. A lot of people doing things not just because they're frisky or they're lustful. Some want to belong. They want to be identified with something, anything. But God is saying to you, I have come. See, what we're celebrating this week is what took place past tense he already shed his blood for you for you and for me but make it personal for you this is not something old and I'm asking God to give his people another revelation of the blood to have a greater appreciation for the blood of Jesus this is not just something, yeah, oh, he shed his blood, now we don't go to hell. No, it's not even about hell. It's about the benefits that we receive now. It's about the benefits that we receive now, that we no longer have to be depressed, that we no longer have to seek and, 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 and walk in the domain of darkness now. Hallelujah. We have Now we are children of the light. Now we have another way. We have been exposed to another way. So that we no longer harm ourselves. So that we no longer feel this void. Because it's not because someone has a mother or a father. That has nothing to do with it. Even those who have a good mother and a father. 
have to be satisfied with Jesus. You can have nothing but have Jesus and have everything that you need. Everything that you need. Everything that you need. Let him in. Even some of you who say I already have but then you see within your life you're still struggling in areas the Lord says no let me in 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 for real this time let me in because you keep going back to the things that you said that you won't go into come on let me in let me in for real this time let me in let me in let me in let me in let me break up all the follow ground let me in let me in let me love you let me care for you let me change your mind let me let me change your heart let me in 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 there's still anger let me in you still feel the betrayal let me in I was betrayed you don't serve a high priest who is not hallelujah familiar with your affliction let me in let me in let me in let me in you're still angry of what they did to you let me in let me in so you open up a crack you said I'm gonna give you this much God I've been hurt so much he said but open the door wide hallelujah and let me in trust me with your whole heart I know how to handle it. I created it. I created the blood that flows through your veins. I created that heart that you were trying so hard to shield from me. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. You won't regret it. Fully embrace me. There's no need to be ashamed or to dwell on the past. Say, no, nah, man, I, I, didn't did, I didn't did this too many times. It doesn't matter how many times you have done it. No matter how many times that you have said it. And then you have to make this announcement. I hear you, Holy Ghost. You make these announcements for, for, for man. You don't have to make no announcement that you're back and that you're coming back. And this time you're going to do this and you're going to do that. You don't need to make no announcement to man. Make the announcement with your heart. Open the door and let me in and I will do the rest. Just love me. They'll see, but you're not doing it for any other man's eyes. That's what I'm trying to teach you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I want a relationship. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. Glory to God. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We honor you, Lord God. We praise your holy name, God. We praise your holy name, God. We praise your holy name, God. Touch your people, Lord. Touch your people, God. Touch them, Lord. Touch them. Touch them, Lord. Touch them. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, God. Touch hearts now, God. I feel you moving, God. I feel hearts turning towards you, God. Radical changes, hallelujah. True conversions, hallelujah. I feel your people turning to you, God. Trusting you, God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Opening up their minds and their hearts to receive you, God. You said, finally. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. God, we honor you for your sacrifice. We thank you. None of this would be possible without you. Our joy is possible because of you. Our hope, even in these uncertain times, is all because of you. Because you live. Because of your blood. Because of your sacrifice. So we thank you. 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 
we are unashamed. We thank you. 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 We thank you, God. I thank you. I thank you, God. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you, God. Some of us know we were nothing without him. We were not, if I could just show my life. I can't even show you my thoughts, how I thought this would be impossible. How I asked the Lord to just let me die because I just couldn't get it right. And he said, Nicole, just love me. Just let me in. I can't boast in nothing. I can't sit before you and boast in anything. It is God. It is his love. It is his mercy, even at the time, 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 he's forgiven me. And now I just want to please him. I just want to please him. I just want to please him, that's all. Lord, we just want to please you. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, Lord, for not trusting you. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. We let you in. And we trust you even in this time, regardless of what the news and regardless of all the reports and any schemes and any scandals, God, we fear you the one, the creator, who has the power of life and death in his hands. And just as you protected Israel and did not allow one hair on their head to be harmed as they crossed over, God, as we cross in, hallelujah, to this next dispensation, as we cross over, hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. You will make sure that your people are covered. You will make sure that your people are protected. You said in your word that you know, hallelujah, the days that we will leave, that we will leave this earth so we give no glory to Corona. Whenever you say it's time, it is time. Even in death, hallelujah, we have the victory. So we do not fear death. You said that your blood, because of your shed blood, you remove the fear of death because we know that to be absent from this body is to be present with you. So God, we bless you. We thank you. We thank you and we praise you. Regardless, regardless, no matter what comes, what can separate us? What can separate us? There's nothing to go back to. There's nothing to go back to. But we look forward. We look forward. We look forward. We look forward, we look forward to our future. We look forward, we look forward. When they're saying there's nothing to look forward to, we look forward. When they're telling us what our future is going to look like, we believe your report and we look forward. For you have given us a glimpse, hallelujah, of our purpose, God. And we look forward, we look forward. We look forward, we look forward, we look forward without fear. We look forward, we know what is to come, but we look forward and we look forward to your return. We look forward to seeing your face, the one who the people called Hosanna. God, we look forward to you to bow at your feet and to be in your presence. to touch your hands, <laughs> to sit and hear with our own ears your voice, <laughs> not just spiritually from an inkling or within our spirit, but we will hear <sighs> consistently your voice. <sighs> and not only worship you in spirit, but physically in these new bodies. Hallelujah. 
but we worship you now. And we honor you now. And we give you the praise. We surrender. We surrender our lives to you. And we thank you and I pray over your people now that you would cover them, that you would put a hedge of protection around you, around them, because your blood gives life, your blood gives healing, your blood gives protection. And I thank you that they're finding their true identity, those who were wandering, those who were suffering. I thank you that you're bringing. You've already brought, but because they have let you in, you're bringing all of the suffering that you did not ordain to an end because although we know that there'll be suffering, but we count it an honor to suffer for your name's sake because through suffering, we are identified with you. So everything sent from the enemy to torment your people. I thank you, God, that you're removing it in the name of Jesus. That everything that they have been struggling with, even since childhood within their mind, you are freeing them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you're showing them who they truly are. You are breaking up every covenant not ordained by you. You are showing them your true identity. Every covenant that has been made with Satan, you are breaking it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Every lie that he said that they could not come out of this covenant, we thank you that your blood, hallelujah, we apply the blood in the mighty name of Jesus with force. Hallelujah. In the mighty name of Jesus took to shatter and destroy, hallelujah, every covenant that was made that the enemy tried to say that they could not come out of every demonic cult, every um, every covenant, every demonic uh, 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 covenant that they were attached to. We thank you that by the power of your blood, you have and are setting them free from it now in the mighty name of Jesus. It's a lie that you can never get out. It's a lie that your finances will, finances will always be caught up in it. It is a lie, hallelujah, that your children, some have sold their children into this thing. Hallelujah, glory to God. But we break and cancel, hallelujah, and destroy every demonic covenant made, every vow made, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is a lie. Remember, the enemy is limited in power. Whatever he has offered you, you can walk away from it. Do not believe the lies of the enemy. And some have come to you and they it came this 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 covenant came in the form of a man and they told you, "No, you have to stay in this. Once you're in this, there's no way out, but the blood of Jesus is your way out." He said, "Just let me in. I will take care of the rest. I will cause them not even to be able to identify you." They said they kill you. He'll give you a new identity. You'll walk right past them being the same flesh, having the same face. You don't have to cut your hair. You don't have to wear a wig. You don't have to do your hair differently. You don't have to have your nose changed differently. When God gives you new life, he gives you a new identity that causes the demons operating and people coming after you have to cause them to turn away from you. It's supernatural. God says, come out of them. Your identity is now in Christ. Don't do that last drop. Don't do that last thing. They said, oh, this is the, this is the last thing you have to do. Don't do it. Don't believe them. Hallelujah. Remember the sons of disobedience. Hallelujah. Because of their desires. I know this will be, you know, if I do this is one last time, this is what will help me. If I don't do this, I'm not going to have anything else. This is your time to trust him. You don't have to do what you've been doing to get what you need for Matthew 6 33 he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. You don't have to do the things that you've been doing. God says, let me let me in. You're in the family of Christ now. Time to act like a son. Take your rightful place. Take your rightful place. I had a vision 
You know, when they say, hey, family, come up here. I want all my family come up here. You come up here. You, my son, come up here. God is saying, come up here. Take your place. Come up here. Take your place. The world needs your voice. Take your place. 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 Come here. Take your place. Stop sitting out there. Take your place. Come from amongst them. Take your place. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Take your place. Stop worrying about what you've done. Take your place. Stop worrying about who and what you were birthed out of. Take your place. Come up here. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Come up. Take your place. 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 Ha! Take your place. Yes, take your place. Take your place. Take your place. God, we thank you. We love you. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God bless. God bless you all. God bless you all. I love you all with the love of the Lord. Um, I thank you all. I pray that this word, I pray that the Lord continues to minister. I pray that his spirit continues to minister even when this broadcast ends. I pray that someone takes their praise, place that we would walk, that we would accept and take on the identity that the Lord has given us. Fight. Fight. Stop looking at your background and I know it's been popular. I'm not saying that these natural things aren't necessary. You know, finding out where you come and you're this 17%, uh, you know, uh, Irish and all these other things is beautiful but at the end of the day what's most important is that you know your identity and that your spiritual DNA is traced to Christ your creator because this is going to be what assists you in overcoming everything that comes against you this is what's going to help fight off all of those thoughts within your mind that come that you aren't anything that you aren't nobody that you can't you have to go back to your manual and what did your manufacturer say that you can do all things through christ which strengthens you i pray that as the lord continues to give insight through this series that he continues to just break things down for us and that we just continue to go stronger go stronger and the lord that you know we're encouraged and that we just continue thank you lord mm, i just feel his presence that we just continue to just become everything that God has intended us to be and more so than that that we just love him 
that we just love him, that our love just increases and increases and grows and grows and grows. Because when our love for him grows, our love for ourselves grows. The more we find out about God, the more we find out about ourselves, okay? It's <laughs> that way because he created us. So you wanna know about yourself, who you are, what's in you, what your gifts are, what you're really made of. Seek the Father, spend time with the Father, talk the Father, talk to the Father, let him in, surrender. And all those things that plagued you before, all those little things about your life that you don't know that you're trying to find in your mother and in your family tree, you're gonna find in the tree of life. He can tell you who you are and who you'll be better than the one who gave birth to you because he knew you before he formed you. To get back to me, I have to get to him. To see me, I have to see him. Which is why he says, love me, seek me. Because then you'll go beyond all the mess that you see and get to your true identity. I love you all with the love of the Lord. I pray that you all have a wonderful night. I'll let you all know when the next teachings are um, coming forward from this series. And um, yes, I love you all with the love of the Lord. I just, I just feel the spirit. I pray that you continue the rest of your evening, that God continue to keep you all safe, that you continue to be encouraged. And I love you all with the love of the Lord. You all have a blessed night. God bless you. Love you all.